Welcome to our first webinar, COVID vaccination, question time for service users and carers. I am Hajar Begum, co-chair for Tower Hamlet's Mental Health Working Together Group, and I will be chairing today's session. We will be recording today's session, just to let everybody know. <clears throat> we are aware that the information out there can be confusing, and we are here to listen to your concerns. Just to give you a brief outline of how today's Q&A session will be. Firstly, we will be answering questions that have been sent in to us, so thank you so much. Um, we, we will also be taking questions from yourselves, and these questions can be put into the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom. There also will be an opportunity for you to ask questions verbally. We will be, ask, uh, we'll be taking questions in Bengali, if there are any, and we will try to address them as best as we can. Um, please click the raise hands function and I will then call your name and you'll be unmuted and be able to speak. Um, also, just to mention the NHS staff webinar, which were two of them, um, answered a lot of questions which can be viewed on YouTube. Um, along myself, we have an expert panel joining us today and I would let them introduce themselves, um, their expertise, and most importantly, the experience of the vaccination, if vaccinated, and whether um, they've had COVID. Um, Frank, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, Hajar, thank you very much. So my name is Frank Röhricht. I'm a consultant psychiatrist at ELFT and have been working at ELFT and different uh, previous sort of forms of ELFT for more than 20 years. I am also the Medical Director for Research, Innovation and Medical Education. And as far as COVID and COVID vaccination is concerned, um, given my role as a Medical Director for Research, I took on the task of regularly looking at the literature that's been published, all the findings that come from the science around um, uh, COVID as, a, as an illness, but as well as uh, the uh, COVID vaccination that we have now available, obviously, to um, members of staff and the public. And I'm um, hoping that um, the um, searches that I've done over some time now in terms of the literature that I looked at uh, will be sufficient to answer all your questions. I'm looking forward to receiving all your questions today. Thank you. Tanya, please. I'm Tanya Rahman. Um, I'm one of the mental health doctors at Stepney and Wapping um, community. Um, I've been a psychiatrist for, for a, a few years now, and um, I've taken the, the Pfizer vaccine and I've had no problems. And I speak, um, just to add, um, I speak um, Bengali, the Dhaka variety, so um, that I can try and use that to help. I should probably quickly add, I forgot to mention that I, first of all, I had COVID uh, uh, last year, uh, very mild. Uh, luckily, um, I had a complete loss of um, um, taste and, and, and smell at the time for about four weeks. And I have also received the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, without any side effects. Thank you, Frank. Um, just to add to what Tanya said, yeah, I'm here to support Tanya and I speak Sileti and, you know, we try our best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Marissa? Hi, my name is Marissa Wayne and I'm the Health Development Coordinator in the People Participation Team, but I'm also a vaccinator at the Westfield Vaccination Centre. Um, I've also had COVID myself in January this year and I've recently had and my vaccination as well so hopefully if you've got any questions around those areas I can help ease some anxiety and give you a bit of insight on what to expect at your vaccination. Thank you Marcia and um, just before we go on to the questions just um, we have a poll that's going to pop up on your screen um, we just want you to tick which box is relevant for you thank you. And it's the Covid vaccination and there's one question Okay, um, I'm going to ask the first question. <clears throat> um, for our first question that we have received, how long does the vaccination give you immunity? 
Um, would you, is anybody would like to ask Frank, would you like to start? I think Tanya will go first and I will chip in. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, with, um, as I stand with the um, COVID um, vaccine, we, we don't know exactly at the moment how long, but we think um, since people, the people who've had COVID, they seem to have, um, if I'm right, Frank, around like six months of um, immunity. And we hope that the vaccines will deliver more than that. Yeah, so I think uh, it's important to um, remember that uh, we, because we have never had um, um, a COVID infection of this kind before, uh, we will have to wait for some more scientific figures to help us to answer that question. The six months has now been quite uh, reliably established and it's also worth to remember that the virus, the, the coronavirus that causes the COVID illness uh, is uh, a virus of a family of other viruses that are similar. So we have some experience and we have got some knowledge from previous SARS virus infections. And there we have, um, um, there we, from, from those um, um, vaccine uh, na nations and infection problems, we know that about two years, uh, people have had um, um, immunity after their acute infection. Uh, thank you, Frank. Um, I see Craig has his hand up. Is it okay if we take his question? Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we, yes, can. we, yeah, we can, Craig. Yeah, yeah, no, great. It's great you're putting this event on for us. Um, so I'm a carer for my father in his 80s, and... When he was offered the vaccine, I was offered it with him. So I've had my first uh, Pfizer vaccine, and we're going to have our second one probably the start of April. Um, my question was that <clears throat> also because I work in people participation and I'm a part-time staff member, I get emails about um, the AstraZeneca vaccine. So... I, I just wanted to clarify if it's safe to have two different vaccines. I think my understanding is that hasn't been tested and people aren't sure if that's safe or not, but I wanted to get clarity moving forward or if one type of vaccine is enough. So first of all, Craig, I, I'm surprised to hear that you are supposed to get a different uh, vaccine the second time. So, so far the arrangements have uh, always clearly stated that people should have the same vaccine first and second time. Uh, there is some research um, at the moment underway to explore as to whether uh, it is um, um, okay, safe, and probably even beneficial to use different vaccines at different times. But uh, so far, the recommendation is still that you should receive the same one at the second time. Can I, sorry, can I just clarify my question? Is that right? Yeah, please. Because I didn't explain it very well. So I've had the first Pfizer vaccine, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that I'm going to have the second Pfizer vaccine through my father's doctor's surgery. Okay. I'm his carer. And separate to that, I've been offered a a vaccine as a staff member, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, so my, my question was, should I be having two sets of two different vaccines? Is that safe? I'm, I'm assuming it's not, but I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Does that, it, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's clearly not necessary, Craig, to have two different sets of uh, vaccinations. Uh, is it safe? That's a matter that is difficult to answer at this moment in time, but it's uh, not necessary because one vaccine gives you um, full protection, so there is no need to go for two different um, vaccines. So I think that the reason that you've been called by ELFT or that you've been offered uh, vaccination from ELFT is because um, they probably don't know that you've already had your vaccination from elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, Craig. Um, I also have Ian with his hand up. Hi, Ian. Hello, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? 
Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, this is kind of uh, a double barrel question. Um, basically, last year, March, I fell ill with um, coronavirus. Since then, I've been I've been ill for 11 months now. Um, they're calling it what we all know as long COVID. Um, still suffering from terrible symptoms. Um, obviously, all I hear is that um, people are getting the vaccine and you should take the vaccine. But for me, um, versus your questionnaire, which you just sent, my answer would be no at this precise moment in time because I'm still suffering many symptoms which I don't understand and neither do the doctors seem to understand. And I just don't want to complicate um anything in, in case I have any reactions from the actual vaccine. So I just want to know what contingency plans have you got for people with long COVID, number one. And number two, um, there doesn't seem to be, and I just need to raise this as well with you guys because you're health professionals. I have had an absolutely terrible time in locating a COVID clinic, getting straight answers about a COVID clinic, um, phoned up various hospitals. They say they don't know what I'm talking about. Phoned up my GP. They don't know what I'm talking about either. Um, and that went on for months and months, even though they said these things were out. <clears throat> and even though hospital professionals have said that I've got long COVID, for some reason, there is no straight and easy path to get treatment. So me getting the vaccine just seems like it's going to be so far away if I can't even get the first thing sorted out and, 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 and get rid of all these symptoms and get well. <clears throat> um, first of all, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that you had this like horrible time and a horrible experience. Um, and um, I think Frank will probably have to help me out a little bit here. I think we don't have um, a lot of research yet on, on long COVID. Am I right in, in saying that, um, Frank? Um, and the thing, the thing is, um, with, with the vaccines as well, um, I, I, I'm, I must admit, I'm not entirely sure how it works, how long co having long COVID and the vaccination advice works. Um, so I am going to, uh, and the second, the second, um, part that you said is that locating a place to have a vaccine, it is, I can imagine it being very difficult actually for some people to locate where to have it. Um, uh, and I think the way it works is that each borough in, um, invites, am I right in saying that, um, is it, um, Marsha? Um, each borough like invites people according to there's a stratification um, yeah so you've got your priority group yeah. so you'll get an invitation and that would be if you've got like a long-term health condition it would be via the GP as well um, and then that would take you through to select various different centres so you'd have a choice of different centres in different um, areas of say this is Tower Hamlets but until you get that opening where you go through that process to book, then you, you probably, it's not very visible for people to see. So I don't know if Ian, did you yeah. get an invitation to have the vaccination? Um, um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, we can. Um, no, I've had no invitation at all. Um, to really be honest, I just feel like I'm thousands of people that have just fallen through the cracks and just forgotten once you have long COVID. I can't even get access to a COVID clinic to get treatment, let alone anyone even thinking about giving me a vaccine. So on both ends, I just feel totally lost, zero help out there, no matter how many different professional um, people I speak to, um, no matter how many doctors, how many hospitals I've been to, no one's got a straight answer or there's no easy access to either a COVID clinic to get treatment for long COVID and help or any conversation about me getting a vaccine. So on both ends, I just feel like it's a total failure, in my opinion, 
for myself. There's probably so let me, with the let same me, from my point of view, um, say a few things, Ian. I mean, again, sorry to hear that long COVID is, is, is un very unpleasant according to all the reports that we get from patients. And I'm really sorry to hear that you have this condition. It is um, a condition that is not fully understood yet. It is a condition where a lot of research is going forward. And it's a condition where we just see the clinics being built and emerging and the offer for patients um, um, being um, uh, put out there as flexible as possible. Because one of the things that we know about long COVID now is that it is it means many different things to different people. So it can um, uh, feature as breathing difficulties. One of the uh, main symptoms seems to be chronic fatigue, tiredness, uh, lack of energy. Um, but, but as you can already see from these two examples of symptoms, obviously the help, the treatment uh, will look very differently if you have this or the other symptom. So within the trust, um, we uh, have identified this as a problem, as, as a gap in, 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 in services. And we've started to work with colleagues from different places with obviously our primary care GP colleagues, as well as specialist hospital colleagues to see how we can A, start to develop um, a, an offer that addresses symptoms on, in, in different ways, but also to make sure that these services are better advertised and more accessible uh, um, um, to patients. So I think it is uh, not very satisfactory. I totally agree with you, but I think uh, we do see now um, um, a better recognition of the problem going forward. As far as the vaccination is concerned, that is, um, uh, first of all, just to explain how the government um, um, tried to roll this out. Uh, as you know, about a third of the population has now been vaccinated, uh, more than 20 million people. And the way the government decided to go about this was to define um, priority groups. So people who are most vulnerable, if and when they do get the COVID infection, and that were, uh, in the first place, the elderly people, everybody over the age of 80, then over the age of 70, and now over the age of 60. In addition, uh, people with um, different types of um, um, chronic, um, uh, in particular, health problems, some of these diseases can make uh, you feel, uh, make you be, become more vulnerable to having a severe form of the infection. So this is why only at this time, younger people and people with um, mental health problems um, are uh, on the priority list, so to speak. So the, the, the government decided to work sort of through these different uh, population groups. And then thirdly, as far as long COVID and the vaccines concerned, all the recommendations from the scientists at the moment say that long COVID is um, shouldn't stop you from getting the vaccination. However, I fully understand where you're coming from um, and that you may want to delay this. And, may, um, and I think given that you had COVID, um, you will naturally be hopefully protected to a certain extent. So uh, I think it's, a, it's an individual judgment that, that people make as to whether they take the vaccine despite the fact that they had COVID and despite the fact that they have symptoms of long COVID. Okay, thank you for answering my questions. Um, all I can do is just wait until things move along. I guess. There's... I mean, what you what you may want to do, Ian, is if you if you want to drop a line to anyone on the panel, uh, I can um, talk to the colleagues who are actually responsible for linking in with the um, um, development of COVID clinics and see if somebody can be in touch with you to help you with your symptom problems. That would be great. Would you just yep. want me to post my number or, or something? Yeah, your name and your number or your email address, whatever, the best way okay. to contact you. And then I can uh, find out who can actually help you with your health problems as well. So thank you very much. It's much appreciated. You're welcome. Thank you. And we've also put Frank's email address in the chat. <laughs> thank you. Um, I've seen there's a few questions that have been put in the chat, but we're going to just go back to the questions that were submitted to us first, if that's okay. I'm just going to continue with the second question. Okay. Has anyone who has received the vaccination got COVID and how 
bad was it? I I believe people have um, uh, uh, most people who've had the the vaccine have had only one dose, and that offers a certain amount of protection, a good amount, I believe, um, Frank. But it still does, and it still means that you might be vulnerable getting getting the um, COVID illness. However, you're less it's less likely to be. Um, you know, very severe to the point that you end up in hospital. Is that's correct, isn't it, um, Frank? Yeah. So I think you, you're right. It's it's very important not to forget that uh, the two doses of the vaccine are important because the first vaccine um, uh, um, um, shot stimulates the immune system to start to produce a particular form of immunity, and the second one that you get is the booster. So only after the second one, we have that high level of protection that all the initial um, um, studies have, have, have demonstrated. So in the region of more than 95%. That means there, there, there is a small percentage left in terms of uh, um, a possibility that you could still have an infection. However, all the science tells us that those who've been vaccinated and do get an infection, very small numbers, will um, still be protected against a severe form of COVID. So not really uh, uh, being at risk of, for example, uh, needing some um, hospital treatment. You know? So I think that's, that's um, uh, why it's so crucially important to make sure that you get both shots of the vaccine and not only one in order to get the full amount of the protection. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I think Craig has his hand up again. Craig, sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'll just continue with the next question. If the um, can I can I ask the question really quickly? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I saw your hand yeah. up. There. I wasn't sure if that was uh, for yeah. me. Yeah. Just really quickly, because um, I know a lot of other people want to talk. So I put the question in the Q&A. So basically, Frank, you said before that viruses calm down historically through herd immunity and mass vaccination programs. And you said that with the COVID pandemic, we might have to have regular annual vaccinations like the flu vaccination to deal with the new variants. Um, you told me this probably two or three months ago. Has, has your answer changed or is it still much the same? Because I know a lot has changed since then. Mm, yeah, no, thank you. I mean, the answer is more or less the same. So uh, one of the things it, that is important for people who are vulnerable to have it um, each year. If that's going to be the same scenario for the coronavirus that we don't know yet, um, but it could well be that it's necessary um, um, after certain periods to have like a, 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 a refresher vaccination that stimulates immune system in order to be sure that all these variants are covered. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. If the vaccination, if the vaccine does neither prevent you from catching the virus or spreading the virus, why should I? Uh, why should an already healthy person take it? Okay, the the first part um, is that um, that it, that you're querying whether it. It prevents it, it prevents it or not. Well, it does. It does prevent people 
um, as we've already discussed, it does reduce the chances by a lot, even after the first dose, by a lot. And you're less likely to get it um, as severe. So that's the first question. And the, and the second uh, part, Hajara, um, just, just remind me, the second part of the question. Sure. The second yeah. part is, okay, um, why should an already healthy person take it? If I um, and also there was a bit about like spreading it as well. I'm sorry, apologies. Yeah. With the spread, um, I think the ev evidence hasn't quite come out as, as strongly, uh, frankly, if I'm right in saying about the spread, but it's, it's showing that it may, maybe it doesn't spread as, as much. Is, is that correct, um, Frank? So we have um, evidence now, not only from the studies that um, started to look at the effects of um, the vaccines before they were actually uh, um, 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 uh, yeah, allowed to be um, um, brought to, to the public, but we also have now evidence from the um, vaccination programs. So there is the Scottish study that's been published or that's in the process of being published that looked at quite a high number of people, I think. I, I can't remember the exact number. I was just trying to find the About 5.4 million people, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So really a huge uh, number by any um, um, scientific uh, um, means. And that study uh, has demonstrated that the spreading is also clearly going down. So that the vaccination not only has a protective effect on the individual in terms of not being, uh, not getting ill or not getting severely ill, but it also has an effect on uh, um, uh, the further spreading of the virus within the community. So there's clear evidence to, su to, to support that now. To what extent that is the case, that is the only question that we cannot answer right now. But it demonstrates again the, the importance of taking the vaccine for your own protection and for the protection of others in order to achieve this um, immunity status within our population. And uh, as far as younger people are concerned, I think it's also important to um, um, very briefly talk about the fact that even though it's mostly um, um, elderly people um, who have had very severe forms of COVID, unfortunately, it is um, completely impossible to predict as to whether a younger person may or may not um, have a severe cause of the illness. So we unfortunately do have seen, and the hospital uh, colleagues talk about that, that uh, uh, even younger people have been suffering from quite severe forms of COVID and required to be admitted into hospital. And, and uh, unfortunately, some younger people also died from, from, from COVID infection. So it is something that is not only relevant for people who are vulnerable and or elderly. Okay, thank you for our next question. Um, if I have the vaccine, but I am still able to contract the virus, then why should I bother? Um, we've talked a little bit about it in, in the questions. Yes, there is that possibility, but it's less so that you might get the virus. Um, and if you do get it, um, it's you're less likely to, to end up in hospital, less likely to be as severe. So um, I think it is important to actually take it. And even the first dose will help to, to a large degree as they're finding now. <coughs> I don't know if you want to add anything, Frank, to that. Well, no, I think we, we've already answered that question. With It was more, quite similar to the previous question, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, what are the side effects of the vaccine? Well, um, it, it, does, it does vary, but it's usually quite, quite mild if somebody gets any um, side effects. Um, a lot of people won't get any side effects. It might be, if they do get side effects, it might be some, you know, soreness at the site of, of where the vaccine's been given. If they might get headaches, they might feel um, a bit nauseous, maybe, or or it might be that they, they feel a bit fatigued. Um, is, is there anything else, like, um, Frank, there's a, um, generally, and they pass within a week or so, I think, within a week. Yeah. 
So a small percentage of those who received the vaccine had flu-like symptoms for about mostly 24 hours. So that can uh, include all the signs that you would normally experience, such as um, um, having sort of muscle pain and, and, and feeling a bit sort of shivery under the weather, um, up to uh, um, um, a little bit of temperature. But that is self-limited and comes to an end within mostly 24 hours, very rarely up to 48 hours. I think the side effects uh, uh, that people are mostly concerned about are those of severe nature. Um, and uh, the good news is that now, and, and again, this is a, because of the um, um, large number of people who already received the vaccination, that we've got data from um, all these um, national um, uh, recording systems that we know that severe side effects such as um, a allergic reaction, which is the um, only one that has been really reported, are very, very rare. So that is the reason why um, um, people who receive particularly the Pfizer vaccine, where it has been um, slightly more frequent than with the AstraZeneca vaccine, need to stay for about 15, in some places, 30 minutes. That depends on the arrangements locally after they receive the vaccine, just to observe and make sure that they do not develop any severe allergic reactions. So the few people who developed a severe allergic reaction, and this is um, a percentage of uh, 0.0 something, just to be very clear about numbers here, very, very low, yeah? They require um, 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 a, a, a particular um, a treatment which all the vaccination clinics have on site in order to give it to people if and when they experience these allergic reactions. So that's what we know about um, side effects. So in summary, very rare, uh, mostly uh, 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 with um, few exceptions, um, side effects that are uh, quite tolerable and will not um, have any long-term um, um, complications. Thank you. Um, there's one question that was, my question is, I'm concerned that my, by vaccinating so many people worldwide, might this mean that a more dangerous form of this virus will emerge that's resistant to these vaccinations? <laughs> Uh, as is happening with many bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics. My thinking on this is that not everyone will take the vaccination and the vaccination will not work for some. So this could mean we'd be in even more danger in the future. Sorry, I know that's a long one. I can repeat it if necessary. I think um, it's been answered to some degree, hasn't it, Frank? Because you talked about like more people who are immunized, the less likely um, they are to um, get the virus and that sort of impacts on the mutation, um, mutations. Am I right in saying that from what you've said? Yeah, but, but my guess is that Hajara's question is slightly different. I right. Think you, you gave, uh, in, I saw the question in, 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 in writing. So I think you mentioned the, uh, comparison with antibiotics and the resistance that um, um, some bugs are developing in response to the worldwide uh, uh, prescription of these uh, antibiotics. I think the mechanism is different there, Hajara. Um, and um, um, we do know that viruses, I mean, the, we are surrounded by bugs, um, they're, they're everywhere. And uh, uh, we cannot obviously reliably say that no, at no point will there not be a more dangerous uh, buggy merge that we will have to deal with when it comes to that. But all the science we've seen so far suggests that the variations, these mutations of the coronavirus are captured in terms of the immunity that we get from the vaccination quite sufficiently. Um, however, there are um, um, a few uh, variants out there where it seems that some vaccines are more effective than others in addressing those. So this goes back then to the earlier point of could well be that um, at some point in the future, uh, uh, we will be offered another vaccine that is more specifically 
helping us to have an immune response to that particular variant. Yeah? Uh, but, but the dangerousness has not been an issue so far. What we've seen with the variants is that some of them seem to be more infectious than others. They seem to have the, the, the way the viruses sort of work, they, they attach themselves to certain uh, cells in our body. And that uh, mechanism seems to have changed a bit with some of the variants. So they're more likely to, for that reason, then cause an infection. But the infection has not been more severe than those with the previous variants. Does that answer your question, Ajara? Thank you. Good. Um, we have one in the message. We have heard, heard concerns from people about the impact of the vaccination on fertility. Are you able to say if there is a link between fertility and COVID vaccinations? I think there was a lot of concern when people were first being vaccinated about this. Um, even a lot of my, uh, my friends who, um, who are not in the medical profession were very worried about it. Um, I, as far as up to date, I don't think there is any evidence. Am I right in saying, Frank, that you, it's linked to fertility? I don't think there's any evidence. No, there's no evidence whatsoever. Um, and there's also no um, plausible mechanism to, um, um, uh, that, would under, uh, uh, that would support that claim that there's a link between the vaccination and fertility. You know? Uh, those who are interested in, 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 in hearing more about that specific topic, because th that's a question, you're right, it came up so many times. Um, uh, I think there was a webinar specifically looking at uh, um, um, fertility, uh, the vaccination in pregnancy and, and in breastfeeding. I think that link um, has been posted so we can see if we can distribute that as well to uh, all the participants of this webinar. But, but you're absolutely right. There is no evidence to support that um, idea that the vaccination impacts on people's fertility. Just to add, I went at the vaccination centre as well. It's part of the screening questions. So you'll kind of have an opportunity to be screened, various questions about health conditions. And part of that is about fertility, pregnancy, breastfeeding. And the trained professional will go through those options with you. Um, but Frank's right. Currently, we have we do vaccinate people, but obviously it's an informed choice. So it's entirely up to you that we give you all of the information um, that we can, so that you can make that informed choice. Yeah, absolutely. But it's important to make an informed choice on the basis of the right information. You know. Yes, definitely. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. with social media these days, there's so many fancy ideas circulating, and the people just. Um, uh, retweet and recopy and 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 so it multiplies very quickly even though it's scientifically absolutely unfounded uh, yeah um, I mean the, the issue for example with breastfeeding and pregnancy the the only reason why this was initially approached with caution was that because of the studies that um, underpinned the um, registration of the vaccinations they didn't include um, um, pregnant women. They didn't look at um, um, side effects uh, um, um, uh, of any kind in relation to breastfeeding. And, but again, there was no specific mechanism in the body that would suggest that the vaccination and breastfeeding, for example, would have any bearing on each other. But, but the caution was just because it was um, not scientifically um, supported through the trials. Thank you. Um, I have one question. Um, how, in the, how many spike protein, proteins do the vaccine, vaccines control for? Oh. I'm going to have to ask Frank to well, answer that I, one, if you know. I would also have to um, clearly say, I don't know. We can ask our um, in, in microbiologist, uh, Dr. Giovanni Sata, if he's got an answer to that question. Maybe we can come back to, if people leave the email addresses, um, maybe we can come back to, I, I don't know if um, le um, where uh, there's a mechanism that we can have um, the question, um, the, e the details of the page, 
of our service users confidentially sent to us in some way, I don't know, rather than going in the chat box. We can just produce another Q&A document uh, with all the questions that we have and then it can be made uh, widely available. Yeah, we could do that. We um, could just keep it. And we will post unanswered questions on the ELF website. Just yeah, well. and we can come back to people by linking in with our microbiologist colleagues, I suppose, or immunologists, whoever. Right, okay. Um, Do we have any questions in our chat box to... Yeah, um, that, uh, we have one more question. I'm just... Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't. Is long COVID not similar to... CFS, mm -hmm. all viruses delete your vitamins and minerals and one needs to rep replenish them. Mm. Tanya, you want to go first? Or? Um, well, anecdotally, I have a, co a colleague who's got long COVID and in, in many, many ways, the way he's presenting, um, and this is just one case, and for the evidence base, I'm going to have to ask Frank, it does, its symptoms look very similar, but I think things like graded exercise are not shown to work, are they? Like the treatments are not quite the same. Am I right in saying that, Frank, at, at the moment? Well, we, we, there, there's no study has actually looked at that so far. Right, so first right. of all, so, uh, CFS, it stands for chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and the chronic fatigue syndrome is a condition that has um, um, been investigated in terms of its causes for many, many years. Um, there's still a, a bit of a scientific uh, debate, uh, um, and it seems to be that it, it doesn't always mean the same in the, in, in, uh, from individual to individual. Uh, what we do know is that, and this is where the question comes from, there's some similarities that a, a post-viral uh, fatigue can emerge from viral infections. So that um, might well be the case for long COVID, that in that sense, um, one of the key core symptoms of, of the long COVID syndrome um, um, is suggestive of a post-viral uh, uh, fatigue syndrome. Um, the exact mechanism is something that, it's, it, it, again, is very difficult to, to, to describe. There are various um, factors impacting on that. You know? We do know, for example, that the coronavirus does um, 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 directly affect uh, nerve cells, for example. So that could well be one of the mechanisms whereby um, um, patients come to suffer from this chronic fatigue uh, syndrome. As far as treatment is concerned, we don't know yet. So uh, in, in, in for chronic fatigue, uh, one of the treatments among others that has uh, been been uh, suggested is um, the very, very gradual um, uh, exposure to exercising. It's not um, uniformly accepted as a, a treatment of choice, but it helped some people. So that's probably the best we can say about that. Okay, thank you. Um, what ingredients are in the vaccine? Shall I have a go or do you want to? Please do. Frank. Okay. And um, well, this, the, the main two types that are out there at the moment are, are the Pfizer and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. The, the Pfizer vaccine um, works um, in, it, it's something called um, mRNA. It uses a code um, to sort of mimic, uh, mimic the virus. Um, uh, and um, in in the um, the AstraZeneca um, uh, virus, uh, sorry, vaccine that they get the cold, egg, something similar to a cold virus, or they get the cold virus, and they put they use the DNA a small, small fraction of the DNA. Um, is that? I think that's the best way to describe it, isn't it, um, Frank? Yeah, I, I, I guess the question is probably going into diff to a different direction. So, oh, right. First of all, you're right. Yes, the, 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 the two main vaccines that we're using at the moment, the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca, use a different mechanism in order to stimulate our immune system to 
produce um, um, immune responses yeah, as in, in form of antibodies and also specific cells, the T cells that can actually detect the virus and help to destroy it. So, uh, but, but I guess that most people, uh, apart from that particular mechanism, are uh, concerned about the other ingredients that a vaccine uh, uh, may carry along. Uh, for example, in terms of the risk of creating a, a, an allergic reaction. Uh, and uh, uh, for religious purposes, I know a lot of people have been concerned that certain products uh, um, should uh, um, uh, not be contained in, in the vaccine for them um, to be able to, to actually accept the vaccine. Um, and so, I mean, I'm looking at the, at the moment here are at two documents produced by the Department of Health. Um, all this information is freely available on the internet. We can actually summarize and you, where you can get a full list of all the ingredients that is actually in those vaccines. I know for sure that for religious purposes, there is no, nothing in there that uh, uh, would um, uh, deter uh, um, for example, a Muslim person to 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 take that uh, a particular vaccine, so it is it it is acceptable. All the faith leaders have looked at the ingredients and have also supported that and have said um, it is fine to take it. Um, and, and in terms of uh, substances they call allergens, I mean that would be a very very specific issue for some uh, um, uh, people who have had previously an allergic reaction of some severity to um, a particular product, they may want to look this up. But this is a very, very small uh, um, um, segment of the population. Most people um, um, will never have had any problems with allergic reactions. But these lists are available. I, I don't think it's pointless now to read them out here. Yeah, But, but we, we can also help people if they want to have, want to know where to find the information in terms of what exactly is in there. And also there's no egg egg in these like vaccines right, people right. are worried so it's vegan <laughs> yeah absolutely right yeah um should one suffer adverse effects post vaccination who would be held accountable and what compensation would the nhs provide mm. okay interesting question um given that it is unlikely to cause anything severe. I think it wouldn't be very likely that that anybody would get compensation um, unless there's like negligence shown, which means that someone wasn't careful, didn't warn people about like the very, very, very small possibility of something extremely serious happening. Yeah, I think you're right, Frank. Yeah. Yeah. Marissa? Just going to say the screening questions at the vaccination centre kind of cover um, if you've had any anaphylactic shock and they go through about any your health history um, before you would have the vaccination. So, yeah, in that sense, you would get an opportunity to talk about your history and if you've had any reactions, if you did have a reaction. Generally, at the, say at the Westfield Vaccination Centre, we would recommend that you go to your GP and we wouldn't give the vaccination. So you'd have a GP there when you have the vaccination, just so that you've got all extra measures in place. Um, but yeah, generally, a lot of that, you'll, you'll have a, a opportunity to go through quite a lot of information that will be asked to you that hopefully would alleviate any of the chance of um, any severe reactions or long term reactions. So I think we need to uh, remind ourselves that before any medical product can actually be offered to the public, um, every, uh, uh, this would have to go through a very complicated um, uh, regulation and approval process. Yeah? So, and that applies to vaccinations as well. Um, so when you look, for example, at the Department of Health website, you will find what's called Regulation 174 information, and that means that it's a, it's a medicinal product and the medicinal product uh, will have to have a proven evidence base. It needs to have been tested in, in, in trials. And that was done uh, with both vaccines uh, uh, quite robustly. There, there's always been this concern that because it was uh, done in a relatively short space of time that they were cutting corners, but that was not the case. They've applied the same 
uh, um, procedures in terms of uh, different phases the, the, the vaccines were tested uh, and evaluated um, as they would have done with any other vaccines beforehand. And so once that process is, is, it has been completed and the um, regulatory agency, the, uh, um, the national body has approved the use of the vaccine, they will define how it sh should be used. They will uh, specify, for example, that the, this vaccine, for example, has to be administered in a particular place into a muscle yeah, of, of the body. And um, they will uh, define all the precautions that need to be taken, as Marissa said, in terms of um, taking, um, um, asking people certain questions and making sure that um, all those contraindications are actually uh, considered. But if all of that has been done, there is no case for um, um, any sort of legal challenge because that's done then uh, according to, to the law and according to good medical practice. And uh, on top of that, uh, and again, uh, uh, just to uh, um, remind us also of the fact that what we mentioned early on, that we've not seen any um, uh, severe long-term complications um, uh, that have been associated with, with those vaccines. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a possibility of developing long COVID from the vaccine? Um, given that it reduces the chances of getting severe COVID, I would have thought it's, it's not very likely at all, Frank. No, I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, as long as um, it protects against getting COVID, then you cannot have long COVID because um, long COVID is a condition that develops post COVID. So you've got the infection and then you have post COVID. And then if that lasts for longer than, I think the definition is now 12 weeks, then you per definition suffer from long COVID, but the COVID infection is the starting point. The vaccine protects against the um, um, infection, so the answer is no. Okay, thank you. Um, I had... um, how long did they do the trials for before releasing it to the public? Um, from um, Frank can correct me from what I know is as in when the virus first came out in in Wuhan um, I believe that people um, research scientists um, started to get information remember that um, they had the original SARS as well um, uh, about 20 years ago or so so they so they started to get information I think it started as soon as um, as, as I understand it, as soon as that, as soon as the first um, incidences were, were coming out in Wuhan, is, is that correct, um, Frank? It pretty much started then with the World Health Organization getting involved, etc. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know the exact uh, um, um, time it, when it started to, uh, but, but I, I obviously, as soon as they've, they developed, um, um, the identification uh, of the virus, that they really knew what to look out for. Um, and um, the, the specific uh, antigens, so these signals on the surface of the virus, that were um, the key target for uh, the vaccinations. So it took, um, um, I think, a bit under than a year's time. Um, and um, But the timing of the development of uh, for example, the specific new vaccine, this Pfizer vaccine, uh, again needs to be um, understood in the context of previous work that was done scientifically already. So that means it did already um, um, make use of uh, scientific knowledge that was developed before we actually entered this pandemic. So it's not a completely new technique as such. Yeah? But um, the, the development of those vaccines that we've got in, in, in now in use um, uh, is certainly uh, um, um, less than a year. Thank you. Um, we do not seem to know much about how the vaccine reacts with other medication. So how do we know 
it is safe to take it if we are taking a combination of other drugs? Um, again, I might need to be corrected by, by Frank or Adid um, too. Um, we do know um, in, enough already about how vaccines work. And apart from, um, Pfizer has a slightly different way of working, but essentially it does something similar to what other vaccines do. So we do actually know to some degree. Um, Frank, do you want to add, add to that at all? Yeah, slightly different uh, uh, um, answer on my side. It, uh, what, what we need to um, um, keep in mind here is that what is going to be injected into your body is a very um, labile substance. It's not going to stay in your body. So that means it's not going to uh, have a longer term chance to interfere and interact with, with medication that you may take on a regular basis. It's very quickly actually metabolized in, in, in the system. Um, and so um, I'm not aware of any uh, reports that have suggested that uh, there's reason to expect any interaction with prescribed medication in that sense. I mean, just to add, even anticoagulants are part of the screening questions and you can still have your vaccine if you're taking um, like anticoagulants, like uh, warfarin, and medication like that, we just take a little bit of extra time just to put a little bit of pressure there. But generally, um, yeah, even if you're taking those sort of medications, definitely come along and have your vaccination if that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. Thanks. Um, if you already have the virus, then have the vaccine, could your immune system overreact and cause you to get really ill? So say it again. If you have already have, if you've already had the sorry, if you've already had the virus, my mistake. Ah. Then have the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Could your immune system overreact and cause you to get really ill? I don't think there's any evidence of that. Is there, Frank? No. Um, any scientific evidence? No. So I, I think this question. Uh, is most likely um, connecting with concerns that have been raised in the past. Um, some people may remember that we had uh, a lot of um, public debates about uh, vaccinations in the past because there was a suggestion that it might the vaccines in general might uh, uh, induce some some so-called autoimmune diseases. You know? There's one particular autoimmune disease that's very frequently quoted in that context is a, a, a mouthful. It's called the Guillain-Barré syndrome. That's probably the one that you may come across when you search for that on the internet. Now, the interesting um, um, scientific fact around that is that uh, a lot of uh, um, um, epidemiological uh, studies have demonstrated that people who've been vaccinated, and it doesn't matter with what kind of vaccine, sort of had lower um, uh, numbers of these autoimmune diseases. Yeah? So uh, that in itself is already obviously a very clear evidence against that particular worry. Um, I remember that I listened to one particular interview on that topic uh, by a world uh, expert in in in. in uh, um, uh, biology, and he kind of sort of said at the end of the day, one could even argue that the vaccine is protective of these autoimmune diseases, which is not a claim they make because it's not what you take the vaccine for. Um, but but I think this is important to uh, put into context. The question is to whether this vaccine introduces an, an, an over uh, immune reaction of any kind would have to be answered in the context of what we know about the mechanism of any kind of vaccination, and how the body responds to those. You know, it's a very specific immune response that is triggered by um, the vaccine. And that is because the vaccine carries information, a signal uh, or an antigen, as we say, that stimulates the body to just produce a, an immune response to that particular target. It's a very specific way that the body responds to that. Just to add up from my personal experience, because I had COVID in January 
and I had my vaccine booked and I had to delay it for four weeks and I was very unwell with COVID probably for, you know, four or five weeks. Um, I had my vaccination two weeks ago and, you know, obviously that runs around your mind because you're thinking, you know, I don't want to feel like how I felt previously. Is this going to make me feel, you know, worse again? And obviously the recommendation is that you wait at least four weeks. Um, and I was absolutely fine. So um, I just had like a little bit of, um, for 24 to 48 hours, like temperature, and and that was it. So it was like, I was really relieved. I can imagine that causes anxiety in people, but wondering if they're going to kind of get those symptoms that are going to come back and you can get long COVID from it. But yeah, generally I would say, yeah, just wait four weeks and then have your vaccination if you've had COVID. Thank you, Musa. I have one more question um, before we can ask if anyone wants to have a general conversation on this. Um, did they do blind testing? Um, that's all I have. Plasma. So I'm, I'm going to have to ask Frank about that. Um, the research. Um, I, I imagine it would be like randomized control type of things. Um, yes, how many of those trials? Yeah, yes, of well, course. I think that's the only way to establish as to whether a particular treatment uh, has the, the effects that it claims to have. You will have to uh, um, put it through a trial, a randomized controlled trial where one group gets the substance as such and another group gets um, a placebo or something which is not uh, um, at all working along those lines. And that has been done and that's been uh, blinded because that's an important condition in these trials so that the researchers uh, cannot uh, um, 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 yeah, uh, uh, um, fiddle around with, with the results. They, they will have to look at the outcomes and they don't know who got the vaccine and who didn't get it. So that's the blinded nature of these trials. Yeah? And only um, due to that methodology has been established that um, the, the, the vaccine is effective. Um, thank you. Um, that's all the questions that were submitted. Um, is there any other questions that anyone would like to put in the chat or raise their hand? Okay, I can see Craig has his hand up. Hi, Craig. <coughs> yeah, no, this has been really helpful. Um, my question was, there's lots of different factors and variables around when we're going to get back to normal. So we've got the vaccination program, we've got the herd immunity, we've got different variants that might infect people faster. Um, also, we see it seems to be happening in waves. So they seem to open up the country, then there's more infections and they close it down, the infections close. And then also the other issue is people talked about the winter, that it seems to spread more in the winter. So through the vaccination program and herd immunity, I'm imagining that we will slowly return to normal life and these kind of repeated waves will reduce. But do we have any idea... Is there any kind of predictions of long term when we can return to normal life and when these variables, these unpredictable variables, variables can be controlled? It's that's a difficult question. Um, it's on what we call epidemiologically on like a public health level. Um, I. I honestly don't know the answer to that. I know that the vaccine is a way to get a get out strategy. Um, but Frank, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. No, I mean, if, uh, uh, this is the million dollar question. Um, and uh, that's why it is certainly not um, recommendable to be a politician these days, I suppose, to, 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 to make these very tough decisions as to when are people allowed to do this and that again. And, and um, so... Um, but, but, but I think my, my personal um, guess is that uh, by summer, um, um, we will uh, see most things being back to normal. I mean, at least as much as 
the rules and regulations are concerned, I'm, I'm pretty sure that lots of people will have um, will feel hesitant and will feel anxious going back into uh, what they used to do in terms of meeting people, sitting in groups, uh, having close proximity to others. So I think it will that will take some time. But I think with the vaccination program uh, uh, being on track uh, um, and um, uh, the government is suggesting that uh, um, everybody over the age of 18, as far as I remember, will have been vaccinated or at least have had, had an offer to be vaccinated by July. Um, we stand good chances in this country um, that we're going to get out of this um, um, impasse. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Okay, um, I can't see any other questions or oh, any hands up. Um, um, should we, um, uh, Frank or Tanya, does anybody want to uh, clarify any other information about any frequent questions that are asked or if you feel we've covered it? Um, I, I have actually been very concerned about my community, well, your community as well, um, being Bengali about the reduced rate of, um, you know, uptake of the vaccine. Um, and I was just wondering if we, um, if we had any, anybody, like any of our service users who, who were from the back, background giving their point, points of view, like, um, you know, about, about the vaccine, but it has been shown, hasn't it? And I've been very concerned about that. Just check, I can't see any hands up. And I can speak um, something in Bengali as well if people need me to, you know, so that's what I'm here for. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I can't, s okay, I've got Ian who has his hand up. Hi, Ian. Um, hello, good afternoon once again. Um, just want to ask a quick um, question. I have posted my details to um, Frank or Dr. Frank. Um, I just want to know if you've received them. I have seen that you've put your email address. So would it be better for me to just email you my details um, with a quick breakdown of what's actually been going on? Yeah, I, I've seen it, Ian, in, in the chat box, but, but it would be good if you could send it uh, in that way to my to my email address. Yes, please, do that. Okay, I'll definitely do that. And once again, thank you for your help. Not at all. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Tanya. I think um, we don't have any questions at the moment, but yeah, um, it would be nice to, if, to be forwarded some questions for Tanya or me for next time, um, as the audience is quite small today. But yeah, um, with myself and experiences with my family, I've noticed that there's a bit of a lot not wanting to take the vaccine. And I think it's all to do with the fact of misled information and not understanding exactly what, you know, what is actually good and bad in terms of the virus and the vaccination. And I think this would be a great opportunity to be for Tanya or any of us to answer these questions. But um, at the moment, we don't seem to have any questions but if we do please do forward them on and hopefully we can take those up but we need to work on those areas. yeah I was also wondering if if any um one did want to send questions in Bengali writing I um I can't read it that well but I could get somebody to read it and um translate it so if, if someone did come up with questions later on I don't know if there's a contact at all that they can submit the questions to um and i'm happy to try and oblige really um yeah that's great tanya what i will do we'll do is um uh, if we will put e lee bell's email in the uh, yeah. chat or if you any emails to be questions to be forwarded to her then she can forward it to tanya as well thank you but um i'll just check to see if we have So I think just to support Hajara's point um, in terms of the particular um, concerns that we have heard about from different uh, um, um, black and ethnic minority populations, I think that is obviously crucially important that you come forward with your questions and that you 
uh, talk to people who um, can respond to the questions because it is quite concerning that in those communities we've not seen the same level of vaccination as in other communities, particularly because there was some earlier evidence that we've seen last year that um, um, the infections in, in, in those communities have been more severe than other communities. So there is a higher need even uh, in order to, to be protected. Um, um, I also, um, you know, things like multi-generational households and um, it's just, uh, that's why I think there's even more reason to really, in my personal opinion, to go for, go for the vaccine. And I'm of that background, and I did make the decision to go for the vaccine. And even if language is a barrier, once you get to the vaccination centre, for example, if you come to Westfield, we've got um, an account with new um, um, language line, so we can get a translator there for you. Um, you can bring somebody with you, a carer, somebody that can talk and translate for you, so that you, you can ask those questions and understand everything about the, the vaccine as well. Thank you. And also, I think Sophia's put it in the chat as well. Um, there is actually a mobile um, vaccination, like mobile vaccination at East London Mosque, uh, which are uh, there. So if anybody wanted to go there for further information as well, it's in here. So Sophia's put on Saturday morning trial. Um, and there's Bengali and Somali interpreters. But I think the, the more of the majority are actually and not going to the um, vaccination centers centers even if the, um they just i think the information that they're lacking needs to be addressed first um through for example tanya or this or any other because there's questions that they're not understanding when it's answered and it's a lot to do with barrier language and also members of the family not being able to explain the terminology so yeah we would really help for us and for yourself to email us with any concerns regarding that if even Bangladesh or Somalian or any community but yeah we're kind of looking to address the Bengali community at the moment as well. The other thing is I don't know how whether you can have Bengali keys uh, how Bengali keyboards work so maybe it might be that they send it in writing so maybe we might need a, a normal like um postage address or something like that that's what i'm thinking and we can um because it might i, I don't know how Bing, uh, bengali you know i have an english keyboard for instance i wouldn't have any idea of changing it how to change it to bengali um yeah i think along that line i think um when it comes to when we get the questions we well, hopefully a lot of, yeah we'll have to but i don't think they're going to be written in bengali majority of the time it's okay okay yeah. If you came to that, we've got translations, you got me as well. So, <laughs> just about, um, but um, yeah, you know, this really is something that really needs to be addressed. And I've just seen it a lot amongst my community as well when I go out and speak to people regarding the vaccination um, and have their opinions. And I get neighbors, elderly neighbors coming to me who have children that are 19, 20 as well. They come to me anyway regarding other things that I do for them, not filling their forms. And they mention it. And when I say, are you going to have it done? They said, no, no, no. My son said, no. My daughter said, no. So there's quite a bit of um, areas that we're not acknowledging on that needs to be raised. And so that would be good if we can get those questions in. Um, okay. Um, I think uh, we've got a COVID vaccination poll that's just come up. Sorry, everyone. If you just want to click on it. And we're actually coming nearer to the end of today's Q&A. Um, and um, is there anything else, uh, Frank, Tony, or Marissa, would you like to say? Or anything oh, else I, say I would just like to reinforce the one message that, that I had early on, and that is, if you're in doubt, uh, then make sure that you ask and talk to many people and not just to one source, that you do get your information from different places, that you have... You make what 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 uh, Marissa called an informed choice. Yeah, so an informed choice is based on good information, and good information means that you've got to make sure that you also talk to um, various experts in the field, and not just rely on your social media or any other sort of narrow channel of information. 
Um, and also the B, um, not the BBC, well, you can look at the BBC, but there's the NHS Choices site as well, I believe, that has quite reliable and very simple terms um, about the vaccine. Um, so I just thought, and it's a reliable source, so um, I just thought I'd mention that. And if people have a chance to do some feedback, so next time that we do something like this, we can, we can improve upon it and reinforce what is good, that would be really good. Yeah. Um, um, we also have a survey that's going to be... Yeah, that's what, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, um, I think, yeah, that's... But, um, yeah, if, has anybody else got any further questions or just in general any... I can't see any hands up, but I think today was a great session and even for myself, I, a, bit, a lot of things were finalised and made much more clearer and um, I think, um, yeah... I spoke for myself and um, I've, we've had some thank yous in the messages as well and thank you for everyone who did attend and thank you for us ans asking the questions and that's what we're here for to help and we are all in this together so and we will get there's gonna be a brighter day that they say she's coming <laughs> we just have to wait but yeah thank you everyone. thank you to all our panelists as well thank you you're welcome bye bye, bye.